I used to live in this creative compound in Reseda, California. It was almost like it was almost like a creative hostel where just a bunch of people lived. And there was like bunk rooms and rooms in a backyard. And one week I went home for the holidays. And when I came back, my roommates that I'd lived with, who were two good friends of mine, were waiting for me because they had to tell me something. And apparently, while I was gone, somebody else had moved into our room. And it was this little Asian girl. And apparently she had started off like sweet and innocent and normal. But she started to say that there was like bad energy in the space. She just started talking about bad energy energy and that there was like bad energy in the space and then she had to start saging things and she was saging the rooms and saging the backyard and saging the kitchen and eventually everybody was like hey like you need to stop saging everything there's there's like smoke everywhere like you you need to stop and apparently when they took her sage away the landlord to try to like calm the other tenants took her to like a local psychic to get her evaluated to try to give her like peace of mind about the bad energy and the psychic told this girl the bad energy isn't around you the bad energy is you. And this girl just lost it. She stopped talking and she stopped eating and she stopped cleaning herself. And she just started like standing in the yard on one foot with her fists clenched, just like staring off into the distance. And my two friends who are grown men, big guys, start telling me that like, this is the scariest person that they've ever met. And I'm just standing there fresh off the holidays while they're they're briefing me about this new roommate that we have. And I'm watching her in the yard, just standing there with the landlord talking to her, trying to like snap her out of it. And while we're watching her, the girl like, she starts like pissing herself in the yard. And the landlord has to spray her down with a hose to try to like shock her out of it and like clean her. And it's not working. So the landlord has to ask her husband to manually pick her up and put her into our room to stop freaking out the other tenants and we still have to sleep in that room like we don't want her in there with us and eventually we have to go to bed because we have work in the morning and we go in there and she's just standing in the corner of this room little Asian girl with black hair covering her face looking like the grudge girl in the corner of our bedroom but we're like okay like we have to go to bed uh she she's not moving so she's not much of a threat and in the middle of the night one of my roommates goes to the bathroom and mind you she has not moved in five hours but at 3 a.m when he's in the bathroom he comes out and she's standing in front of the door. She hadn't moved in hours and apparently she also wasn't walking normally. When she would move, she would like shuffle, just one foot in front of the other, just shuffling forwards and backwards. She wouldn't like turn, she would like walk and pivot and only walk in like 90 degree angles. So we're freaking out and we start Googling, like why would somebody walk in straight lines? And the, the top Google search is demons only walk in straight lines and we're like she's a demon no 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 she is a demon and at this point, we're horrified of this girl. We are so scared. So when the roommate that she jump scared in the bathroom the night before, when his alarm went off for work, I immediately got up with him and left the room. I'm not staying with her in this room in the morning. But our other roommate, who's like this really, really big guy, he's a large, imposing man, didn't want to get up because he just wanted to sleep in that day. So he just stayed in the room. And apparently, he had just turned her back to her and he's laying there. And he was telling me that he was thinking, whatever, it's just me and her alone alone in here, but she's not going to touch me. She's not going to do anything. And right as, as he was thinking it, she took her pointer finger and just poked him right on his spine, dude. And he just jumped up and freaked out and just looked at her and was like, what do you want? And this girl said, and I'll never forget this. This girl said, I don't think you're safe in this room alone with me. And he goes, I think you're right. And just grown man jumps up out of the room, runs out and comes to me sitting in the common area and tells me what he's doing. For me, that's enough. I'm like, landlord's about to hear it from me. I'm about to make a fuss about this. She's leaving today. Me and Josie were really good tenants. So for us to tell the landlord that we weren't okay with this, she had to take it very seriously. Because at this point, it is either her or us. Somebody is leaving today. The landlord wasn't going to be back until nighttime. So we just had to watch this girl stand in the yard. And she's just in the blazing sun for an entire day, looking off into the distance on one foot with her fists clenched. Part of me honestly felt so sorry for her. But the the other part of me was absolutely terrified of this girl. And I didn't want this girl anywhere near me. She seemed so determined to just stay on her post. But the human body is only capable of balancing 
on one foot in the sun for so long. And about 20 minutes before the landlord showed up, she shuffled over to an outdoor couch and fell asleep. And me and Josie filled the landlord in about everything that happened, and she promised that she's gonna take care of it in the morning. But she convinced us that the best thing that we could do right now is let the girl get some rest. When my other roommate got home, three of us, three grown men, we tiptoed past this girl and snuck into our room so we could sleep in peace tonight. And you are damn right we locked our door. The door to our room was a big glass sliding door, so we were about to keep tabs on this girl the entire time until we fell asleep. And when the next morning came around, we looked into the yard and she wasn't on the couch anymore. We came to the conclusion that she's definitely deep into the backyard, right back at it. So all three of us decided to sneak out of the room to find the landlord to double down about what we told her the day before. Like, this girl is leaving today. We headed to the common area, but when we got in there, we were all shocked. The girl was sitting on the couch on her laptop looking groomed and rested. None of us knew what to say, but we were really surprised when she greeted us in a really kind, sweet manner. This girl was acting completely normal, like her bizarre behavior the past three days didn't happen. So me and the guys grabbed a cup of coffee from the kitchen and went back into the yard to have a game plan meeting. I was kind of worried that they were going to have like a change of heart, but luckily we were all still on the same page. She's got to go. We did not trust this girl even remotely. And the landlord clearly saw us having a conversation, so she came out there to see where our heads were at. Unfortunately, the landlord was in a tough place financially, and she clearly saw the girl's new behavior as a way for her to keep a tenant. Like I said before, this place was kind of like a creative commune, and we all had a really good relationship with this landlord. And we didn't want to see her struggling, so we all agreed out of sympathy to let it play out, but with the caveat that if she started to act like she was acting the day before, she had to leave no questions asked. So you know, life goes on as usual for a couple of days, because we all have jobs so we're in and out of the house kind of ignoring this girl and nobody has time to keep an eye on somebody every single moment of the day and we also had some relief because the landlord moved her into the solo cabin across the yard from us every time i would see her she'd be sitting on the couch out front of her cabin working on her laptop i had no interest in interacting with this girl at this point but she seemed to be snapped out of it and only interested in diligently working by herself and honestly for me that works if you leave me alone i'll leave you alone it's all good i like to think i'm not a hard person to live with i keep my area clean i don't touch anybody else's stuff i'm out of the house very often for work and I'll happily share my food with anybody that asks. And I don't mind living with other people as long as they live up to those standards as well. But one thing that I cannot stand is when people eat my food without asking or replenishing the fridge. So about a week after this demon girl fiasco, I come home from work and I'm feeling a little snackish. And I know that I have a six pack of blueberry yogurts waiting for me in my fridge. I was thinking about these yogurts on the drive home. And you can imagine when I came home and settled in and looked into my fridge looking for my Greek yogurts and found none of them, I was ready to make a fuss about it because one even two i could live with but to take down an entire pack of greek yogurts in one day without consulting the said owner of these yogurts breaks every boundary of what it means to be a good roommate so when josie and bulgaria got home my other two roommates i had to sit the boys down for a little chat and confront them about these yogurts and to my surprise both of them were denying eating them to my face in fact bulgaria accused me of eating his entire bag of doritos which i did not do and don't get me wrong he had the right to accuse me because i've eaten my fair share of his doritos in the past we weren't about to get into a real fight about eating each other's food because all of us were always really good about providing our fair share of groceries. But we came to the conclusion that one of these other tenants must have been eating out of our fridge. You think that a girl acting like a demon for a couple days would draw a larger reaction out of us than some Doritos and Greek yogurt going missing? But you'd be wrong because once Josie found out that his stash of candy was also missing, we made an absolute scene. We waited for everybody to get home and called for a tenant meeting. This wasn't out of the ordinary because with so many strangers living together, it was important for all of us to get together and have open discussions to keep the peace. And usually these types of meetings ended on a really positive note with apologies and reparations. There were about 10 people that lived in this commune besides me, Josie, and Bulgaria. There was the landlord and her husband that stayed in a trailer, a mother and a daughter that rented a room in the main house, a father and a young son that rented one of the cabins, a Twitch streamer that rented a solo room, a DJ who rented another cabin, and the landlord's two sons that stayed in the garage together. And the demon girl, but she doesn't count because she never leaves her couch or the cabin. And when the meeting started, I thought everybody was going to have the same reaction because these issues are the most common and recurring. I expected everybody to be kind of like uninterested. But once we said that we were missing things, all of the other tenants started listing the things that they were missing. Everybody seemed to be pointing fingers and dodging the blame. It was so weird because every other time we had a meeting like this, somebody would fess up and make it right because all you had to do is buy somebody lunch and apologize and things were good. But this time it seemed like either everybody was stealing from each other or one person was stealing from 
from everybody in line. It was a super unproductive meeting and it ended with the landlord telling everybody to not touch each other's things and threatening everybody that she will find who did it through the CCTV footage if it happened again. And everybody seemed to like that idea because everybody wanted to know who was taking things. But the landlord didn't really like to watch the CCTV footage unless something really serious happened because she felt like it was an invasion of privacy. The only reason she has the CCTV is to keep her tenants safe. There was cameras in every room because with so many strangers living together and sometimes females living in the same room with males, you kind of need an overarching layer of security. She wasn't willing to whip out the footage over food because it wasn't that serious, but she said that if it keeps happening, she will. So whoever's doing it better stop now to save yourself the embarrassment. Everyone seemed completely okay with this conclusion. So the tension of the meeting kind of subsided and me and the guys left to go get dinner because clearly we had nothing to eat in our room. We went and did a pickup order of Thai food and we stopped in the kitchen on the way back to pick up some plates and silverware. And we noticed that there was none left. And this happens sometimes because not everybody cleans up after themselves properly or immediately cleans their dishes and puts it back. But the sink and the dishwasher were also empty. As you can imagine, this was supremely annoying because now we had to eat pad thai with our fingers and drink soup out of the takeout container. We made it work, but it was the cherry on top of the night. And we all went to bed super annoyed. The next day I woke up and the first thing I did was take a shower, obviously. And wouldn't you know it, my shampoo and body wash was nowhere to be found. I'm so ticked off at this point. So I just beeline to the nearest bathroom to see if anybody left it there. And when I get to the bathroom, Josie's already arguing with the father that lives with his young son, apparently about toilet paper. This guy's claiming that we used all of his toilet paper. And to be fair, three grown men living in a room, we use his toilet paper sometimes, but we always replenish the toilet paper if we finish the roll. I selfishly avoid that argument and head to the kitchen to talk to the landlord because I'm trying to find my body wash. And I see the mother and the daughter that live in the main house arguing with Bulgaria in the kitchen because apparently their favorite coffee mugs are missing. I think somebody's pranking us at this point because there's no way everybody's stuff could be going missing like this. When the mother and daughter finish accusing Bulgaria of taking their mugs, which he did use sometimes, but he would always clean them and put them back. Bulgaria said, I will buy you new mugs. I just want to know where the picture of my family went. And I immediately budge in and ask him what he's talking about because he seems really upset. And he says that the picture that's framed next to his bed is missing. He seemed really emotional about it because he moved all the way here from Bulgaria, hence his name Bulgaria, and it was a framed picture of him and his family. And my initial reaction is to console him because he's my friend and he seems really upset about it. And he cuts me off and says, make sure none of your stuff is missing either. Because food is one thing, but personal belongings going missing is a whole nother issue. So we all go back to our rooms to make sure that no noticeable items are gone. And we tell Josie and the father to do the same as we go back to our room. There seemed to be a consensus that everybody wanted to get to the bottom of this. And I go to look through all of my personal items and wouldn't you know it, the watch that my grandfather gave me is also missing. It wasn't an overly expensive watch, but it had a lot of sentimental value to me. And it had a small compartment with a hidden picture of me in kindergarten on the bottom end of the watch. It was almost like a locket watch. My grandfather wore this for years before he passed away. So at this point I'm fuming. And at the same time, Josie discovers that there's a letter missing from his fiance. He does long distance with her. And apparently there was a Polaroid picture of, of the day that he proposed to her inside of that letter. Now all of us are so upset and this is grounds to confront our landlord. We're ready to go over the CCTV footage together. At this point, nobody in the commune trusts each other because everybody has personal items missing and nobody knows who's lying. Nobody's being too accusatory or confrontational, but we're all very eager for the landlord to get home. Everybody's wandering around looking into drawers and cabinets in the common areas, but I'm at the point where I don't really care where this stuff is. I'm just killing time until the landlord gets home because the camera footage is going to solve this entire issue. I just make myself a cup of coffee and put it into a disposable cup because there was no mugs left on the premises. And I went and hung out in the front area by the driveway in the garbage cans. I wanted to be the first person to talk to the landlord when she got there. And as the landlord pulls up, I finish my coffee and go to throw it out into the recycling bin. I'm so ready to talk to the landlord, but as I'm closing the recycling bin, I notice a full roll of toilet paper in the corner of it. So I take a closer look and I start digging around a little bit. And it's not only one roll, there's like five rolls of toilet paper in there, accompanied by two full tissue boxes and an entire pack of paper plates and disposable forks. I immediately open the garbage can right next to it. And wouldn't you know it, there's all of the missing food, a full bag of Doritos, five uneaten Greek yogurts, and an array of uneaten leftovers. And right next to the food is my body wash and shampoo, full tubes of toothpaste and three toothbrushes, all of the house mugs, multiple plates and bowls, and all of the silverware in the entire commune. Immediately, I think this is going to be super easy because all we have to do is look at the footage attached to the garage. And we'll see who frantically threw out all of the evidence last night. The landlord walks up to me and I show her what I just found. And I warn her about the scene that she's about to walk into, a crowd of 
very upset tenants. And she's completely fed up at this point as well. And she reassures me that she's going to look at the footage right now. I was happy to hear this, but I didn't like that she inferred that she was going to be the only one to look at the footage. I felt like everybody had the right to see who was doing this. And luckily, when we got into the common area, everybody felt the exact same way. And I didn't have to argue with her myself. It only took about two minutes of everybody talking over her for her to finally comply and open up her laptop in front of everybody. A lot of people in this commune were like really tech savvy. So we immediately hooked up the laptop to the big screen TV in the common room. That way we could all sit comfortably and have a viewing party of the camera footage. And we were all really eager to watch this camera footage. But when I tell you, nobody was ready for what we were about to watch. You could toggle between what camera footage you look at, but the default footage is the camera that's pointed into the backyard. It's a live stream, but you could click on the option to review the archive of footage. And it just automatically goes back four days. And this thing pauses on a freeze frame of a motion detected in the yard at night. And the freeze frame was the most disturbing image I've ever seen. There was a pool table in the middle of the backyard and the girl that we had thought had gotten better was standing on top of the pool table on one foot clenching her fist at 3 a.m. And this was from the same day that she had convinced us that she had snapped out of it and was acting normal. But there she was doing the exact same thing on top of the pool table in the middle of the night. Everybody in the room immediately swung their heads towards the yard to see where she was. And she was just sitting on her couch in front of her cabin working on her laptop as if nothing was wrong. The landlord started to scroll back into the footage to see it. when did she get there and what we saw just made it so much worse once everybody went to sleep she closed her laptop stood up and spent the whole night shuffling back and forth throughout the yard she would plant herself in a different spot every hour until the sun came up and right when the sun came up she shuffled back to her laptop opened it up and continued working and right then we all knew that this girl had not gotten better she just got better at hiding it. we were letting the footage play at like 5x speed waiting for her to move again we would see other tenants leave for work and and the moment that they would leave, she would stand up and walk over into their room and then just leave a couple moments later. After she would leave the room, we would follow the cameras to where she went. And what we came to find was that whenever she would eat something, she would walk into the front and throw the rest of it out into the garbage can. Every time she would go to the bathroom, she would throw out the roll of toilet paper that she used. The only places that didn't have cameras were the bathrooms, but we clearly saw that she would leave the bathrooms with our body washes and our toothbrushes and our toothpastes and then just walk right to the front and throw it out. And I let the group know that I had found three toothbrushes in the garbage can, which means she was going into different people's bathrooms and using somebody else's toothbrush every day. But that's not all. The footage kept getting worse. It seemed like she decided that instead of smudging everything that she touched, she would just start throwing it out because she wasn't allowed to smudge the bad energy off of it. From coffee mugs to plates to pots and pans and even blankets. We were all eager to see the next night's footage because stealing stuff and throwing it out is one thing. Standing on the pool table in the middle of the night is disturbing. What we found on the next night's footage footage changed our perspective entirely. This girl wasn't just weird, she was absolutely unhinged. When everybody went to sleep the next night, she closed her laptop and began shuffling again. But this time, she didn't restrain herself to only the common areas. We switched to the camera that was right outside mine, Josie, and Bulgaria's room. She stood right outside of the sliding glass door and stared in for two straight hours. And every two minutes, she would grab the handle and try to open it. But we had started locking our door at night, so it didn't budge. Watching somebody try the same thing every two minutes for two hours is insane behavior. Me, Josie, and Bulgaria look at each other because we can't believe what we're watching or how we didn't notice her doing this. At the two hour mark, she shuffled away into the backyard away from the main house. There's no cameras in the backyard back there, so we didn't see where she was going. We sat there and watched the footage until about an hour had passed. We were expecting her to shuffle back from the backyard back into frame, but she didn't do that. Our sliding door opened from the inside and we were all expecting one of us to walk out of that room, but it was her. She slid the door open, took one step out, pivoted 180, and closed the door behind her. Then she stood there looking through the glass for another hour. Nobody said anything for a moment until Bulgaria demanded that we switch to the camera that's in our room, because the landlord was clearly trying to avoid switching to those cameras. She looked to me and Josie for confirmation to make sure that that was okay, and we both nodded, absolutely yes. When she switched to our camera, she dragged the timeline back an hour. We watched this girl slide open our back window, crawl through it, and then stand in the corner of our room for an hour before shuffling to the sliding door and letting herself out. She didn't touch anybody or do anything that was more bizarre than what she was already doing, but she had circled the house, climbed in through our window, and unlocked the door from the inside before spending the next hour staring back in. And to make
make things worse, every 20 minutes after, she would slide the door open, pause for a second, then slide it back closed. And just like the night before, when the sun started to come up, she shuffled back to her couch and opened her laptop. The tension in the room felt like a fog at this point, and everybody just wanted to see what she did the next night. Before we fast forwarded to the next night, the father that slept in the room next to us with his son told the landlord to switch to the camera that's behind her from where she's working on the laptop. Some of the tenants seemed a little frustrated with this request because we just wanted to get to the next night's footage, but the landlord did it. I didn't understand what he was looking for at first, and it took everybody about 10 seconds to realize what he was looking for. It's like it hit the whole room at once. From that camera angle, you're able to see her computer screen because it was over her shoulder. We had the landlord zoom in on her home screen, and her screen never changed from the Craigslist homepage. She'd been pretending to work this entire time. She would sporadically tap her fingers on keys as people walked by, but she hadn't actually been doing anything. This girl's been staring at the same webpage for days and then climbing through windows at night. We didn't all want to be so obvious and start staring at her at once, so we all kind of took turns looking at her. Now that we knew that she was faking it, her just sitting in the yard became unbearably creepy. I could feel that all of us were so nervous. I could feel that everybody was so nervous about the possibility of her entering the room while we were watching this footage because everybody just kept looking back at her and then back at the CCT footage screen, then back at her, then back at the screen. But we had to keep going at this point. Even the landlord seemed all in on watching everything that she'd been doing in the past few days. And the second day, she was a little bit more active. It seemed like every time somebody left their room unattended, she couldn't help herself but to go in. And every time she left somebody's room, she would have something with her. She would immediately just walk it to the front garbage can and throw it out. At one point, you could even see that she accidentally touched something and she couldn't help herself but to pick it up and throw it out. It almost seemed like she knew when people were leaving and when they were coming home. Almost as if she memorized everybody's schedule and patterns. This makes the fake working even scarier because she's not sitting there just zoning out. She's sitting there studying. By the time the sun went down at the end of the second day and she had thrown out half of the house's inventory, you could tell she was moving more cautiously. She must have known that people were going to notice that things were missing. So right before everybody started getting home from work, instead of sitting in the open and pretending to be on her laptop, we watched her crawl and hide behind the common room couch. Then we watched almost all of us who were currently sitting in that room walk mindlessly past her or sit and have their dinners on the couch that she was hiding behind. Nobody had any idea that she was back there, and she stayed there and waited for the landlord to lock the main house. I guess everybody assumed that she must have been in her cabin, but she hid in the main house so she would have access to it overnight. As it started getting closer to 3 a.m. and everybody was fast asleep, she started shuffling around the common area. She spent almost an hour doing laps through the living room, then through the kitchen, and down the long hallway to the bedrooms, shuffling forward and then shuffling backward on the way back. She would never turn around. Everybody that lived in the main house was now feeling the same type of fear that me, Josie, and Bulgaria had watching her crawl in through our window. When suddenly she stops her shuffling and tilts her head towards one of the bedrooms as if she heard something and she was curious. She abruptly started speed shuffling towards the sound and we all heard the Twitch streamer mumble something. We all looked at him and then he enunciated. He said, I was gaming late that night, switched to the hallway camera. Then we all watch him open his door to go use the bathroom. And the second that he stepped into the bathroom, she shuffled into his room. The Twitch streamer immediately gave the landlord permission to switch to his bedroom camera. And then we all watched this girl shuffle up to his bed and then crawl under it. None of us could believe what we were seeing and we could see the Twitch streamer visibly shaking. And then we all go back to watching the footage and we watch him come back in and close his door. He sat back down at his desk and played for a whole nother hour with her peeking at him from under his bed. He got up to use the bathroom again before going to sleep. And I know that everybody else in that room was hoping for the same thing that I was hoping for, which was while he was gone, she'd shuffle out of his bedroom and leave him alone, but she didn't. She let him come back into his room, get in his bed and fall asleep before crawling out from under his bed, standing up and facing him. And again, she was balancing on one foot with her fists clenched until the sun came up. And it's almost like she knew when his alarm usually goes off because five minutes before it did, she crawled back under his bed and let this guy get dressed for work and leave. Then she just walked back to her computer and pretended to work again for the day. On the third day, she didn't stay stationary on her couch like she did for the last few days. She waited for everybody to leave to work and started entering everybody's room one by one. Instead of going back to her post at her couch on her computer, she'd go all the way into the backyard, directly into the back right corner, where there's a bunch of plants and foliage and no cameras. We couldn't see what she was doing back there, but it was clear that she was taking items from each person's room and then taking them back there. When she entered our room, we clearly saw her leave with Bulgaria's family photo, my grandfather's watch, and Josie's letter. And she immediately took them and hid them in the backyard. And then she came back one more 
more time and stole Josie's stash of candy, but she hid the candy in the crevice of her couch. Once she had hit everybody's room and taken one item from everybody, she started collecting twigs and sticks from the backyard. We assumed that she was collecting those to just cover all of our personal items that she had stashed in the far corner of the yard. She seemed to be successfully avoiding everybody throughout the day, except for one interaction. She had bumped into the mother and the daughter that lived in the main house while they were on their way out to the daughter's dance competition that night. The daughter would always dress in extravagant outfits because she was a professional background dancer for live performances and concerts. When they crossed paths, it seemed like the girl got very infatuated with the daughter's outfit because she clearly made it a point to have a conversation with them. And the daughter even chimed in while we were watching the footage that the girl kept repeating that she wished that she was as pretty as the daughter and how much she loved her outfit. She stared at the daughter until she completely left the commune. And the second the mother and the daughter were outside of the gate, she beelined directly to their room. The mother and the daughter were always really strict about locking their doors when they left, which all of the tenants should have done, but they were the only ones that were consistently on top of it. That didn't stop her. She went around the side of the house and did the same thing that she did to our room. She slid open their window and climbed in, and she spent the next three hours staring at herself in the daughter's full-length mirror. And right before the mother and the daughter came home from their performance, she slid open the daughter's closet door and went and hid inside of it behind her long coats, then closed the closet behind her. The mother and the daughter didn't take this as well as the other guys did. They both buried their faces in their hands and started crying a little, but they couldn't help but peek through their fingers and continue to watch. We all waited for the landlord's cue to continue to watch the footage after the mother and the daughter changed their clothes and settled into bed out of respect for their privacy. The daughter had opened the closet to hang up her clothes multiple times that night, and in the footage, we could clearly see the girl's feet in the corner of the closet hiding, but the daughter didn't notice anything at the time. We watched them settle into bed, anticipating for the girl to come out of the closet and do her usual pose, but this time she slid the closet door open and came out wearing the daughter's performance outfit before staring at herself in the mirror again, and you could see the girl's facial expression in the mirror, but instead of her usual blank stare, she looked viciously angry. About once an hour, she would go back into the closet and come out in a completely different outfit, and she would look progressively more and more angry. At about 4 a.m., instead of going back into the closet, she went and stood over the daughter, and she held both of her hands about two inches away from the daughter's face. She had all of her fingers outstretched as if she was gripping a basketball, and she just stood there, physically shaking as if she was restraining herself from grabbing the daughter's face. Then she walked back to the mirror and then did the same thing to her own face. She just turned her palms towards her own face and held them just a couple inches off the surface of her skin. This was so terrifying, but so sad at the same time because it was clear as day that she deeply envied the daughter and she hated that she didn't look like her. The daughter was in an all-out cry at this point watching what this girl did to her while she was sleeping and how long she had done it for. And just like the night before, five minutes before the alarm went off, she went back into the closet and hid until they left for the day. Everybody in the room was at the point where they were ready to call the police and have this girl arrested, but there was still one more full night of footage left. On the fourth day, a lot of people were home because it was the weekend, and she stayed mostly inactive. She stayed put at her laptop and only got up to eat a couple of times. The only thing that stood out was that she was slowly eating a couple pieces of Josie's candy here and there that she had hidden inside of the crevice of her couch. The father and the son that lived next to us spent almost the entire day in the yard. And every time the father would go and do something and leave the son in the yard alone with her, she would call the son over and slip him a piece of candy. And she would playfully put her finger over her lips as if she was telling the son that it was their little secret. I could feel the father fuming behind me. Because after all we had seen, there was no way she was simply sharing this candy with him out of the kindness of her heart. We just knew that there had to be some type of malicious intent behind it. And just like we suspected, when the father and the son went out to go pick up some dinner at In-N-Out Burger down the block, she snuck into their room, hid behind their TV stand, and waited for them to go to sleep. We watched them fall asleep, then we waited in anticipation to see what she would do. But before she did anything, the father said, if she touched my son, we're gonna have a serious problem. But we all asked him to keep his cool for five more minutes and he obliged. We all knew that he had a serious temper. He was one of those Harley Davidson biker guys. The only thing this guy cared about in this world was his bike and his son. And there was gonna be no way of calming him down if he saw something that he didn't like. Even though she had been doing really creepy and invasive things, we had yet to see her do anything violent. Once they had fallen asleep, we watched her crawl out and stand over them for almost a half hour 
with Josie's bag of candy in her hand, before gently shaking the son awake with her finger over her mouth just like she had done to him all day. The son was too young to understand how creepy this was, and was just excited that the nice girl was surprising him with more candy. She shared a couple pieces of candy with him while the father was still fast asleep. Then she offered him another, but before she handed it to him, it looked like that she was bargaining with him that he had to do something first, in order to receive the next piece of candy. And she pulled some type of ribbon or string out of her pocket, and tied it around the kid's left wrist before giving him the next piece of candy. We could all feel the father's anger growing as we watched the footage play out. Then she does something that nobody expected. She reaches out her hand, almost inviting the son to hold hands with her, and leave the room. The innocent son obliged and quietly stood up, clearly not trying to wake his father. Then this girl led the son out of the room and down the hallway. She proceeded to walk him all the way through the yard into the back where we couldn't see what they were doing. They were back there for almost an hour, and at that point, the son broke down in tears apologizing to his father, saying that she told him not to tell anybody. He didn't seem physically harmed, but he was clearly shaken up by the whole situation. We continued watching the footage, and she seemed to just walk the son back to his room and tuck him into bed before heading back to the laptop. We're all caught up on the footage at this point, and we're just sitting in that room in complete shock. Some of us were really angry, but I know that all of us were more disturbed than we were angry. The silence was deafening in that room until Josie broke the silence by saying, guys, where did she go? She wasn't on the couch anymore, so we told the landlord to fast forward to see when she left and where she'd gone. And of course, when we fast forward, we watched her sneak up to the room and she saw us watching the footage. She only watched us for a couple minutes and then she shuffled into the back of the yard where we couldn't see. I wanted to call the police before we went back there, but the father was overwhelmed with anger and made it clear that we could call the police on the walkover, but we're all going to the back to confront her right now. None of us were excited to do this and the thought of her knowing that we knew what she was doing was terrifying because if she was crazy before, she might even be violent now. We had a group of 13 people, seven of them being full-grown men. So we figured we'd be okay. We walked all the way into the backyard and we couldn't see her until we went all the way up against the fence and looked behind the small row of bushes. There was only like a three foot gap between the bushes and the fence and she was kneeling all the way in the corner with her back to us. As we got closer, we could see that she was almost on her knees praying to something, but she wasn't regular praying. She had her fingers interlocked, squeezing her hands together and she was aggressively shaking them as if she was praying as hard as she could. We tried calling to her and asking for her to come out, but nothing we said got to her. We still couldn't see what she was praying to. The father clearly had enough, and his anger seemed to override his fear. He marched right back there and body locked her around the waist, and then he carried her out from behind the bushes. And it was almost like she didn't notice that he was doing that and just kept praying as hard as she could. He didn't hurt her or manhandle her. He just placed her in the middle of the circle of people, and she just collapsed back down onto the floor, continuing to pray. And all he said was, you all need to go back there and and see what she's been doing. And of course, I was the closest one to the crevice behind the bushes, and I reluctantly walked back there. And I guess she'd been building some type of shrine. All of the sticks and twigs had been bound together with the same ribbons that she wrapped around the son's wrist. She had built it into like this figure that was standing in the same position that she was standing in every night. It just looked like a woman standing on one foot with her fists clenched, made out of sticks and twigs. And tied to the arms of the figure was the picture of Bulgaria and his family. The Polaroid of of Josie and his fiance, the photo of me from kindergarten from my grandfather's watch, and photos of every other tenant on the property. And then at the base of the shrine was a mouse, a rat, a squirrel, a rabbit, a possum, and a cat. And they had all been sacrificed in the same way right across the neck. I couldn't believe what I was looking at, and then I noticed something that shook me to my core. Each animal had a ribbon wrapped around its front left paw, just like she had done to the sun the night before. I immediately announced to the group that we need to call the police right now. She clearly intended on sacrificing that young boy. And this whole situation changed from a problematic roommate to a dangerous individual immediately. I don't think the father noticed that detail and I didn't want to draw attention to it because I was worried about the father's reaction. At this point, the landlord was rummaging through her personal things because apparently she was only here through a work for stay contract. The landlord was looking for any details that she could find for a family member to contact. And inside of the bag, the landlord found a small journal with a phone number labeled mother. Obviously, she immediately calls the number and we force her to put it onto speakerphone. Because at this point, it's everybody's right to know every detail about what's going on. The mother spoke pretty good English and she 
was super polite upon answering the phone. When the landlord informed her that we were with her daughter, the mom went silent for almost a minute. The landlord was filling her in on the details about what her daughter had been doing during the woman's silence. When the mother finally replied, all she said was, the name that she gave you is not her real name. The work that she had promised she was going to do for you, she's not capable of. My daughter was put into an institution over five years ago for the criminally insane, and she had somehow escaped last month. I don't know how she got to America. I don't know where she got the laptop that you say that she's been working on. I don't know what she's done to you already, but from what you've told me, I'm begging you. For your own safety, do not call the mental health professionals. Call the police. And she immediately hung up. The landlord immediately got on the phone with 911 and walked away from the group, so she wouldn't hear the conversation and snap out of her praying fit, or try to run away. All of us were just praying that she was going to stay put and not put up a fight until the police arrived. And at one point, she stood up and went back into her pose, standing on one foot, fist clenched, but didn't say anything. We were all prepared at that point to restrain her if we needed to. As scared as we were, you couldn't help but feel bad. When the police finally arrived and began to cuff her, she started to plead with us, saying, she promised me I only need to do one more, and all the bad energy would be gone. Please just let me do one more. The police took her away, and that was the last we ever saw of her. I moved out of that commune a week later. But two days before I left, I had to get some type of reassurance, because the police just chalked it up to a paranoid schizophrenic having an episode. They didn't really seem interested in giving us any more information about her or what happened. But we all had our pictures attached to that shrine, so it hit a little different for us. I knew that she was gone and I wasn't going to see her again, but I needed some spiritual reassurance that what she did would have no long-term effects on us. Because I had never dealt with anything like this before, and the only thing me and Josie could come up with was to go back to the temple, the same temple that the landlord brought the girl to that seemed to set off the girl's episode. The police didn't even bother taking the shrine for evidence. They didn't even bother to take any pictures of it for any form of investigation, and none of the other tenants seemed interested in going back there and taking it down or even cleaning it up. So it was still just sitting in the backyard the next day. That didn't sit right with me and Josie. All the other tenants seemed okay with having her removed and moving on with their lives. But me and Josie were on the same page. We reluctantly went back there and grabbed the shrine and went back to the temple. When I tell you, there's no weirder feeling than walking into a psychic's temple with a statue of sticks laced with ribbons and pictures of yourself on it. I mean it. I felt like an absolute whack job walking in there. But I needed somebody that was willing to take the events seriously. Somebody to tell me that it was going to be okay because I was not trying to end up like that girl. This place was almost an hour away and it was absolutely bizarre when we got there. Most psychics just have a storefront or work out of the front of their house. But this lady had a temple that closely resembled a Buddhist temple. There was no signage on the outside or any link to her business on Google Maps. Apparently she just worked word of mouth and our landlord just happened to know her. It wasn't creepy or anything on the inside. It was actually kind of well kept and beautiful. But this lady seemed to be the only person that lived and worked there. So here we are waltzing into a psychic temple with a shrine in our hands. Scared out of our minds looking like absolute crazy people. But naturally, the psychic was happy to see us because business just walked in the door. She was warm and welcoming. We had asked the landlord to call ahead, so she was actually expecting us. She was ready to go and immediately asked to take a look at the shrine. So we just propped it up against the wall for her and she kneeled in front of it and started inspecting it. Me and Josie proceeded to frantically fill her in on all of the events that happened, all the things that the girl was doing, and all the animals that we found in front of the shrine. We also included our suspicions that she had planned to do the same thing to the sun next. She seemed really calm inspecting the shrine and listening to us intensely before she said, you are all very lucky that you caught her when you did. That poor girl has been harassed by this entity since she was a child. She told me that she tried everything that she could to keep it at bay, but that never stopped it from following her. I immediately cut her off and said, if you knew it was an entity following her, why would you tell her that the bad energy wasn't around her, that the bad energy was her? Because she flipped the switch right after you told her that. I definitely came off a little accusatory when I said that, but the psychic seemed to take it well and took a deep breath before continuing. She said, I told her that because it was the truth. That girl was filled with self-hate, envy, and jealousy. And when your vessel is radiating those things, you attract entities like the one that we see here. I advised that poor girl to fix what was going on on the inside, but it seems to me like she embraced it. Her building something like this tells me that instead of doing the inner work, she wanted to make a physical embodiment of the entity to even further remove the blame from herself. She built a structure that made the intangible tangible. I assumed that she had hoped by making a physical embodiment of the entity, she could get a better understanding of it and sever the relationship with it entirely. But instead, it just tethered them tighter together and she began to serve and worship it. As much as I wanted to discredit this psychic and the whole situation to make myself feel better, the way she broke it down made sense to me, especially when you think about when we found her. She wasn't just praying, she was worshiping. 
And when the police had taken her away, she was talking about how she just needed to do one more, as if she was fulfilling tasks for this thing. I couldn't help but ask the psychic if she thought that the girl would go to the extent of sacrificing the son as well. And she replied, unfortunately, by the look of this shrine, I think she was willing, if not planning, to eventually sacrifice you all. I immediately cut her off to remind her that she said she only needed to do one more, only one. And the psychic replied, with these things, it's always just one more. But she got through five animals, didn't she? This was a horrifying realization, especially when you take into account how easily she accessed everybody's room. While we were sleeping, we were so lucky we found the footage when we did. Because who knows what she would have done if we gave her even one more night to serve that entity. Josie immediately changed the direction of the conversation back to the shrine, asking if there was anything we needed to do with this thing. To untether us from what she was doing or if there would be any repercussions from us destroying it or removing our pictures from it. The psychic gently replied, I encourage you to let me incinerate it properly to cut ties between you her and the entity entirely. We were both a little disappointed because the photos that were attached to it had a lot of sentimental value to us, but neither of us were gonna argue with the expert. So we handed it off to her. She wrapped it up in a white cloth and led us into the courtyard of the temple and gently placed it into a fire pit. There was something so eerie about watching it burn because in a way, entertaining this ceremony of an incineration of a shrine gave validity to the idea that this wasn't a mental health event. This was a spiritual event, but it gave us the closure we needed. We even let her do a smudging ritual on us before leaving to make sure all of the bad energy was actually gone. Hey guys, I hope you really enjoyed that story. I hope I scared you. Hope I spooked you. Hope you're here for more. I hope you want to hear more crazy, fun, scary stories from me. And I hope you like, and I hope you subscribe. And I deeply, deeply hope that you click the exclusive member join button below and support the channel. It helps more than you could possibly imagine. If you can't do that and you don't have the means to do that, it's completely okay. I don't mind. Just throw a comment, throw a like, and maybe even consider watching all of the stories I've ever done and liking and commenting on those. I appreciate you. I love you. Back next week.